Right before the director says action, AD said stop, let's cut it. I need to check the gun. Opens the gun and it's a real bullet. No! And there's only one. Yeah. That was loaded. What? One, one real bullet. So and he was and supposed to shoot it like toward that. the camera. It will be not the camera, it will be me. Welcome to Shoot the Shit, a podcast that tells the unfiltered tales of filmmakers' craziest production and on-set experiences. Because every shit situation on set makes for a great story after. I'm Taylor, a director and editor. And I'm Kristen, also a director and editor and creative producer here at No Longer Network. And today we are talking to Igor Pavlovsky, hopefully I'm saying that right, <laughs> a director of photography. Welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Well, yeah, thank you for coming on and uh, and talking with us. But before we jump into your stories, do you want to just give us like, you know, kind of a, a high level overview of what your uh, experience in the uh, in the industry has been so far? OK, um, yeah, I'm, I've been shooting. I've been a director of photography for about um, um, 11 years, the pin for 11 years and the um, so far. I have an article in American Cinematographer magazine in 2018 February issue. Uh, I also, one of my films being on um, Berlin Alley at the 2019, an official selection in Berlin. And um, just recently, uh, we got the official selection on Oscar with um, Saudi film Al Hamur. So that's like. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm uh, obviously we've been friends for a while now. I can like proudly say that you did uh, shoot one of my projects back in film school. So I, mean, I can keep that under my belt when you get giant. I can be like, this guy shot one of my <laughs> I still have it. I still have screenshots from it. And like just recently, I was I was browsing through and I saw the screenshots and oh, that's so cute. <laughs> well, it's it so cute times. memories. <laughs> memories yeah, yeah. no that, that was a really good time that was a really good it was a really good day in the desert you know a couple of days in yeah. the desert. <laughs> but yeah so um i am so curious to catch up with you and hear some crazy stuff that has happened to you on set so just jumping right in um it sounds like you were shooting with yuan wu ping which is like not you know not something you do every day not exactly with him, but with okay. his um, um, apprentice. So do you want to like, tell people who, who he is, sort of what he's known for? So Wu Pin is a um, um, stunt coordinator who worked with uh, Karwai mostly. So that was Karwai's um, stunt coordinator, and you know, who is one of the couple people who really knows the art of ancient Kung Fu. Like not the kung fu we have right now in the modern world, but actual art back in the days. And he is super old. I think right now he is about maybe like ninety years old or so. Uh-huh. And um, I work with um, one of his closest apprentices, whom he taught like during his productions as well. <laughs> yeah, and that was my first Chinese film I did in China. And the director was actually from the. Um, our knife um, environment, like uh, I was shooting his uh, student films when I went back to school. And then one day after, I think, after like five or six years, he called me and he's like, hey, I have a film in China coming. And that was an amazing project because we shot it in, um, I think, 14 days. And it was, most of it was Kung Fu, like most of it was stunt. Like there were people who were flying on the wires, like they were rigging them on the huge cranes and they were jumping on the roofs, like running through the whole little village with a crazy kung fu choreography. And these guys, they were able to do it in like, in such a short amount of time. Like again, we shot it in 14 days and it's like full yeah, length that's feature. A really short period of time to like have so much choreography and so oh. much going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's insane. And the and we never had the uh, overtime by the way. Like we shot everything in like twelve hours. And for wow. China it was also unexpected because they used to like sixteen hours a day, sixteen or twenty, right. like in, in that gap. Finger block days. 
Yeah, yeah. Was the was but, the whole crew? Did they speak English, or was there like some people spoke no. Chinese? Was there any? No, that's an interesting conversation about the um, uh, language. Because I shot also, like I shot in China and Saudi and Russia and America mostly. And the um, and I used to say that filmmaking is um, kind of universal language. Like you really don't like on set. I'm not experiencing problems talking to to the crew. Like I have a translator with me usually, right? It's either the uh, B cam op or um, camera PA who also translates. But um, the first couple of days are kind of rough in terms of like you're getting you're getting to know these people. But then something happened. Like that's why I was saying about the spiritual things that like we understand each other without knowing the language really. Like I don't know how to explain it but when you live there when you're in that environment like you might be speaking with them you might be talking english to them and they might be answering chinese but like you get you understand each other like i don't know how to explain it it's uh, oh maybe only i had this experience i don't know but that was my experience in um uh shooting overseas really sounds like kind of a magical way that I, the film set brought people together from totally different yeah. places and languages. Energies. I love that. Energies. Yeah. And these guys, like, why were we able to do it? We had an amazing crew. Like, the crew. Yeah. And, you know, before I opened China for myself, I always thought that China is some sort of, like, third world country. But when I got there, I was like, that's insane. That's a, that's a country of the future, really. Like, what these guys are capable of doing there, it's insane. Like, I realized that on set they have a problem um, delegating um, delegating jobs in terms of like they can do one thing really good, but if you give them like multiple tasks, they're not gonna do it. But if you're gonna give each like one task, they will do it amazing and they will do it fast. And it's like way freaking faster than we see here in Hollywood, mm -hmm. right? And I had the crew of. The same amount of crew, maybe a little less, as I usually have here. Like on some medium to upscale projects, I have around like 12 people in the genie. Around like 12, 15 people. Um, and there I had, I think, 10 in total. And they were crazy fast. Crazy fast, crazy. Um, really open hearted people. And there's a trick to work with them. Um, like, you know how tension might be high on set and you might be like freaking out. You might be tired. You might be like shouting on people, whatever. <clears throat> and I learned from them that if you shout, you lose your face. Like it's not, it's working against you. Right. And sure. Like you might have overwhelming feelings and frustration, but shouting on people, blaming somebody, that's the worst thing you can do. And like, if you do that to them, you will never going to get uh, respect and respect mm -hmm. what actually Chinese filmmaking is based on. Like if they respect you, they're going to work for you. They're not going to work for money. Like they're going to work for you and they're going to give like 200% of themselves. Like they're not going to care about like how hard the setup is and how fast you want to make it. No, like they respect you. They, they see this leader in you. And they want to give, like, they will love you, like, if they respect you. And what I see here with my crew, but in, right. order, in order to get to that point here, like, you need a history. Like, you need at least, like, five, six years working with your people, right? With your crew here. But there, you can get the respect quicker. And um, I think they um, they're a bit more open and more true, true to to themselves, I would say. And that's actually uh, why we magically made it in 14 days. And it was an amazing film. We shot it only for like $300,000. Wow. Um, full of uh, stunts. And I think it's in one of the top Chinese platforms right now. Like the director, they got his money back and they, they earn. 
I totally see what you're you're saying about you know the people who sort of like yell to get their point across and they get picked <laughs> up. People lose respect for them. I think it's really admirable when someone can really stay calm in the midst of a stressful moment and communicate calmly. And I definitely have more respect for people that can do that. I used to be impossible to work with. <laughs> like maybe Christina remembers. <laughs> But like then, when I when I went to China, it kind of um, like I start um, start getting things with a, a different perspective. So, like really, um, no reason to um, to be frustrated. No reason to be no frustrated. Yes, but no reason to be angry and sad and share your negative energy because they were not saving people's lives. Really, that's true. That's true. You kind of, it kind of puts yeah. things in perspective. And I wonder if, you know, I know that there's kind of this, I guess, uh, like overall idea that, you know, more in the East, in the Eastern part of the world, like the culture is so much more surrounded, uh, like around community rather than individuality. And it kind of sounds like you're experiencing that because like this crew is so, it sounds like the crew is very committed to like the overall process of like getting things done in the most efficient and best way possible. Yeah. Whereas like here it's a little bit different. People are a little bit more looking out for number one, which is themselves, which isn't, you know, necessarily a, a good or bad thing. It's just different perspectives and what you're kind of having to deal with in two different, you know, economies and, and workforces. Absolutely. Yeah. So it sounds like it was a refreshing perspective for you. Yeah. But also another thing I want to say that the, um, like when I came here to LA, uh, my mentality changed. Like it, um, mm. I came in 2013 in January, I think. <clears throat> and um, my mentality shifted within the year of being here. Um, cause like here, it's some sort of the place where all the nations are coming to. Like you can see, you can find the every nation, any like um, uh, people of every country represented here, right? A lot of transplants, yeah. Yes, and the uh, and then I look at it, and instead of kind of being overwhelmed with the with the amount of people and from different cultures, it shifted me to the reality that um, I look at people that all of us we are the same. Like in the inside, we're all the same. Yes, we have a cultural differences, right? In terms of the, uh, we have cultural background, but that's just agreeing. But overall, inside, we're all the same. So what's the point of really like thinking that, let's say you're the best, then I don't know, like another person or like another DP or whatever, like we're all the same. Like, and I don't think that it should be some sort of um, bad vibe on side about it. it makes sense. Kind of it makes things way. a lot harder. It makes things a lot harder when there is that that kind of negative energy on set. So, yeah, oh, sounds like your perspective you know. has changed a bit. <laughs> yes, I think it, I no, think there's no. more people that could uh, adopt that perspective as well. Because I think it's a good way to operate in the world. Absolutely. So I guess moving on to uh, our second story, I'm curious to hear about the Mojave Desert Sandstorm. Uh, that was a quick, uh, that's going to be a quick story. So I think it was my, as far as I remember correctly, I think it was my third film I did, third feature film. And the, um, that's actually how I got my green card because of that okay. film. Because mm -hmm. the um, um, for the um, for artist visa and for a special green card, you have to prove that um, you did some sort of innovation in um, in the industry you're working on. Right? Huh. So okay. my thing was, I created the method of the shooting um, day for night, but in exterior. But I would say I, I didn't fully create it. I developed it. I developed it sort of, um, um, getting, uh, from the, um, Mad Max, 
method, mm -hmm. but expanded it basically. And Mad Max, it was the first um, sort of innovative method of shooting day for night exterior. Because um, when, let's say, you don't have budget to light the desert and you have to shoot it at night, like what are you going to do? Like, for sure, you're going to go day for night. Right? And in my method, like I use the same concept in a way of the overexposing the media instead of, of bringing it down, how people used to do it before. Because like when you're overexposed, you get in the um, so much details, which you can bring down and post, and they're still going to be readable, they're not going to be pitch black, and that's how night with a full moon going to look like. Really. So I was making the test, I was, uh, I was um, going for walks during the night with my light meter, and I was so surprised that I was actually getting the exposure. I was like, that's insane. Like on 1600 ISO, I was getting like F1. Like if I see it in a movie, I would say that's, that's a set, that's lit, but that's a nature. Mm -hmm. And what makes it so beautiful that the nature is not perfect, like not in the perfect set. Um, so... And I developed the concept of uh, how we can make it more believable because at the um, Mad Max, it was more about like dreamy, bluish feeling of the night. In my case, it was actually a like, gray, dark night. Like, and the only thing what we did, we also added in post, uh, we added the stars to make it more believable. Because mm -hmm. usually um, um, your problem is the sky when you're shooting day for night with this method, like sky going to give it up. Yeah. Real, real stuff. quick to interject. Do you want to share what shooting day for night means for anyone who's listening? Maybe doesn't know. Oh, okay. So, um, that's making the day exterior look like night. Okay. Awesome. Which like you might do because Point it's too, too difficult to <laughs> shoot at night or your, your schedule doesn't yeah, allow yeah. for it. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, the budget. In most it's cases, budget. it's budget. budget. Let's say, like, you and can shoot, you can shoot day for night at the um, interior. For, like, it's it's easy. You can just yeah. um, uh, put some diffusion in the windows that bless the lights, and you can make it look like um, uh, it's night for day. I'm sorry, <laughs> my bad. Um, yeah, you can block out the windows. You can create the um, uh, night interior if you have to day outside yeah nice like inside it's interior is possible it's way more possible than the exterior Table out well what's not doable i think it's to shoot night for day exterior like when you have to recreate day oh that's the not, night exterior yeah. <laughs> you need so much light you need to rent the sun oh well <laughs> rent yeah. the sun <laughs> yeah the big enough budget who knows so you yeah. so you took so you kind of took the way mad max did it and like expanded re extended it okay yeah um extended to the um uh to the um um method which can be used like standalone not been based on something so that's why it's also was enough of the kind of creation um, to, um, um, to give me the artist visa first, right? And, um, I think in American cinematographer, they also mentioned that method. I don't remember what it was about the article. So anyways, well, in that film, no, um, we had a sandstorm. Like when we have to shoot at the desert, obviously sometimes when I have a desert, you're gonna have a sandstorm. That was pretty intense and fun. And before that, I was always chasing for these textures. But the textures to shoot, let's say, the blue hour when you barely have a sun, when you barely have light, and like this, this magical texture pops up in the screen, right? It's not. It's like recorded in the um. You have only minutes to ex to express certain feeling when you shoot in, in that conditions. So, in the um, sense store was a blessing for me um, to have it in the picture, but it was nightmare for the rest of the crew because like hope the lenses might get 
dust at this time, but um, uh, we treated nicely. We were prepared. We got all the um, uh, equipment, all the equipment wrapped in uh, plastic plastic bags. Uh, nothing was damaged. Um, our actor, though, did know when. Uh, okay. <laughs> Didn't know where he gonna drive because the scene was about him driving in the hills and suddenly the sandstorm hits and he didn't see where he was driving actually. But we got such an amazing picture. Uh, so that's a little story. <laughs> so he's like kind of driving blind. <laughs> sort of, yes. Yeah, that's scary. That's that scary. Did you guys have like bandanas over your mouth to try to like not breathe it in or goggles or were you just dealing with it? Well, we had only wheeled bags for the camera and we were not yeah. prepared that the um, storm, we, we didn't expect that storm going to hit us. Right. So like I was without goggles or, or, or bandanas. No, but the, um, we had enough stuff to cover the equipment, but for us, it yeah. was kind of unexpected. Yeah. I've been in some, some sandstorms, uh, uh, burning man. And I'm like, you gotta have those goggles. Yeah. It's hard to breathe. You can yeah. be like, coughing and your eyes are watering. It's like, it can be brutal, but you guys just powered through. This was actually, uh, uh Kiki, do you remember how we should have flower? Yes. I remember. It was, uh, what was it? I think it was like 104, right? Oh, it and was probably more than that. I would say it was closer to 110 because we were maybe. also surrounded because we were also by fires. By the fires that were happening in the area. <laughs> oh my God. So that was just adding to the sick. whole thing. I and remember was the... us like, oh yeah, I just remember us walking, like we had an RV parked like close to where we were shooting. And I just remember walking and just getting like tunnel vision because it's so hot. Like you just, you start to like black out. Oh my God. Because you're just standing out there for hours on end. And, and, and you like, can't breathe on also. The no. You couldn't breathe no. because with, with all the um, with all the smell and this ashes, I think we had ash as well, right? Too, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We it's we like it, we actually like got it. I think in the sky at some points, it did like happen to yeah, use yeah. the sun a little bit. So you were a little bit happy about that. <laughs> You're like, well, oh, it's working in our favor. That <laughs> was guys... that interesting condition, and it, it actually worked for the scene really well. I think this real. You guys yeah, put an no, ice pack on the camera. That's wild. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's not the <laughs> first time we've had to do that. Oh we my have, like, god, ice packs because the camera will just overheat. It's like I yeah. can't record things, like, and so we all just kind of like power down and you know give it a little ice bath, and then oh you, my god, you know, get back little, up and shoot for TLC. as long as it will allow you to. Oh, that's wild. Well, yeah. let's move on to. I think you had a story about being chased by a bear. Little story. So that was a part that's of cool. the um, little story. No big deal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was me and my good friend Katie Pruitt, who is um, um, AD and a producer on Severance right now, like this year in second season. Oh, and she worked with Ben for like 15 years or so. So, and we've met in another project, which I think I want to tell the um, story about it as well later on today. Please do. Um, yeah, so. And this was our personal project about the energies around us, about how everything is connected, about the nature, about how we, as um, children, will look at the world differently. We we'll look at the world differently. We we'll look at the. Um, we we'll look at the. We notice the matter of things, right? Like if we look at, let's say, how how the uh, leaf is moving in the air like with a little breeze let's say right and we really were able to catch these moments and pack it in our memories right and for us those moments those moments from the childhood were special because they actually were special or let's say maybe you guys can share those uh, memories with, let's say, riding a bicycle first time. Like, how did it feel? Like, how you feel the air on your face, 
right? How you feel the balance first time, like all these emotions, right? It's pure, pure energies around you. And when we were children, we were capable of catching it better and tracking it better. And we're more present, we up, I think. We're not, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We're not so caught in our, our thoughts about like all this other stuff. We're just in, yeah. in the moment when you're a kid. Yeah. And right now, I think society is so much distracted, like on top of being, let's say, adults and having the um, adult life, responsibilities, and you have to make money, you have to pay bills. On top oh, of it, we're, we're pretty much distracted by, by mass media. Like it's obviously takes the huge part of our life and the, uh, everything in our life got way faster. Like, and we start thinking faster. We got over, like we overstimulating our brain. Like that's why also the stories, they need to, like the, the, um, you know, filmmaking stories, they need to be adapted because let's say the art house, like slow art house not going to be that much interesting, I think, for the modern viewer, as it used to yeah. be like 20 years ago. Like Tarkovsky, I don't know if people are still going to watch Tarkovsky right now. Right? And the project I was shooting was about the, um, was about that. Was it about the, just to slow down, look around yourself, and try to notice the, um, try to see this beautiful world around you, which you really don't see. In most cases, um, I love that message. In, in, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. and we were shooting this project for about like half a year, maybe more. And once we hiked to Mount, Mount Hood in Oregon, and we had like two backpacks with, um, um, pretty like standard light package. We think it, it might be light package. Like I'm talking about the C70 with a couple lenses with a tripod, like Canon C70. Um, and you might think it's kind of like lightweight package, but when you have everything in your backpack, then you're talking about maybe like 50 pounds on your back. And I didn't expect, <laughs> yeah, okay. and I didn't expect that. This hiking to the place where we need to go, if we were trying to find this really cool waterfall in Mount Hood. So we didn't expect that it's going to take that long. So it was um, about two hours hike uphill with the equipment on you. <laughs> like we, we died. That's rough. When we get oh there, we God. died. And we also didn't plan that it's going to take that long. And we were shooting for a couple hours, got amazing footage of amazing, some sort of heaven island in the middle of like nowhere. It was insane. Like the waterfall they have there is just crazy. Have you ever been there yeah. in Manhood? Do you know what no, I'm talking but about? I have to add it to my bucket list now. That's insane. It's the. Uh, yeah. It's the most wonderful waterfall I ever saw with a lake, with a moss, with um, <clears throat> with how water hits rocks. It's like felt so pure and so strong and there was so much energy in it. It's really amazing. Wow. And, um, and we'll be shooting there for like maybe an hour, hour and a half. And then we didn't realize that it's getting darker and we got to go back. And going oh, back gonna take like around two hours as well. So it might take longer because it's darker now. You gotta go a little <laughs> slower. So and that was the thing. We're like, okay, we start we start leaving and we'll do hit sunset. We're like, oh okay, it's sunset, we gotta leave. And then Oh my god. I was like, okay, we have maybe like an hour until it's like total darkness. And like, that's not, and that's then, not a good situation to be in. Yes. Hiking and we didn't out. have any flashlights. Yes. We had maybe flashlights on the phone, but not the ones like you can actually see not where a you're legit going to. One. Yeah. yeah. The phone doesn't <laughs> go very far. Yeah. So, um, we were almost running back, <laughs> running back to the parking lot because, with the 50 pound backpacks. Yes. And like, and we're kind of like, sort of running and then we see that the people who were behind us who were leaving this uh, waterfall as well 
they kind of got faster. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on? And they were drunk. And I was like, damn it. So, and then I realized, and like, when it's, when it's still bright enough, you can see where you're going to, where you're heading to, but you understand that you have maybe like 15, 20 minutes of flight and like, that's it. And you have to go like way longer. And then I hear the uh, bear uh, close to us. Like, I, I thought it's a bear, uh, but the uh, kitty was saying, no, oh, maybe it's like a moose or something, but I think I thought it was a bear. And it was and, also terrifying. Oh, my and then God. We're, and then we're going, like, closer to the uh, to the exit from the park, closer to the parking lot, and I hear it's getting closer and closer. But then, at the very last moment, when we hit complete darkness, somehow we get into the car. <laughs> like we were packed, and we got into the car, we turned on the lights, and we like drove away so fast. And I'm pretty sure the bear was kind of like telling us, "You guys, you have to go." Maybe the bear oh didn't want to eat us, but the bear was like, "Guys, you took so much time here. Please go. Your time like, is up." Yes, that's terrifying. How long? What do you think it was following you for? A uh, good half an hour for sure. No. Yeah. That's a terrifying half hour. What? Well, let's stop. <laughs> yeah. So the whole time you're exiting, you're just like the whole the whole half hour. There's a bear behind not you. Not constantly. Are you not like constantly? But we hear okay. him getting closer and closer, coming and going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But oh yeah. my god, were you worried <laughs> he was going to atta- attack? Well, like we were focused just to get as fast as possible to the parking lot. So just get out. Yeah, that's well, like, scary. When you were hearing it, are you just hearing like a rumble in like the bushes, or are you hearing like like heavy breathing? Like how how are you roaring? Like, oh, like that's for sure a bear. No roaring. Oh, roaring. Oh, yes. just straight up roaring. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. <laughs> it's like ah. <laughs> yes. You're like that's that's not a moose. It's <laughs> not. Yeah. That's not yeah. A moose. <laughs> I would oh be convinced that it's like about to eat me if it's roaring. That seems like it's like a I'm gonna get you kind of a call. Oh, no but, kidding. But oh then my. we thought maybe like he was just guiding us like to kind of scare us. So so we're gonna be faster and we're gonna find our way when it's still darkness. So yeah, maybe That's it was insane. like a defensive, like yeah, like you said, like hey, get out of here, man. Like you know, he's just trying to shoot you guys away. Humans don't belong <laughs> here after dark. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah. fair business to take that care of. That is so crazy. And oh that's insane gosh. when it's getting darker and darker. Um, I don't know if you guys experience it or not, but the, um, there's something magical about it when, when it's getting darker, kind of the forest getting alive, like this yeah. nightlife of the forest, and you hear all the different sounds, you hear owls, oh, yeah. you hear like all sorts of things. It's the um, kind of the... Um, flow of energy by itself it's interesting it's you like this happens to me on on camping trips all the time where i'm like i have to wake up at like three o'clock in the morning because i have to go to the bathroom and i have to like exit the tent and you exit the tent and it's like so dark you feel so alone you feel so powerless as a person because you're like this is not anything that i'm regularly used to or like capable of doing anything about like if anything would happen you know i am powerless it is a very overwhelming powerful feeling yeah for sure for sure um i i've got another uh little title here which kind of makes me think about feeling powerless in certain moments but um to john cusack i heard you were almost shot by john cusack (laughs) yes please explain so that was an interesting project um it sounds interesting oh i don't remember when when we shot it it was like it felt like it was in my previous life uh maybe maybe seven years ago around there so uh that was project we shot in kentucky in louisville okay and when i got it i was excited it was some sort of um cop drama story uh, which um, plays around the african-american community and that thing was really uh powerful back in the days and the um, 
I thought that it's an amazing project. I can uh, support the um, support the story with my skills. It was really interesting for me, and the um, that I think was my first time when I shoot when I shot over uh, out of state. And when we get to Louisville, I was surprised by how things are different there. So it was the it was winter time, and we know that in California it's pretty much the same weather. Uh, besides winter, like in winter we have the rain yeah. seasons. Not really but, many seasons in LA, no. <laughs> but yeah. the rest of the year is sunny, and the weather is kind of constant. And when I got there. Um, I was so amazed by how low the sun was during the day, right? And it was mm. such a beautiful sun. I haven't seen sun like this in years. And I was like, damn it. Like, we can shoot exterior days, like, and be not depend on the um, time of the day, really. Because, like, through the whole day, the sun was amazing. Like, you can shoot mm. amazing landscapes. It's, it was just incredible. And the city itself... It's very interesting with a lot of texture, with a lot of a vibe. Like a really cool city. I, f- I fell in love with um, Louisville. And I found, um, like, we were, we were driving to find the, uh, for, for the location scout, right? And they were found amazing locations, and people were so much open to us. And they were like, yeah, yeah, sure, sh- shoot here, f- like, for free. We don't need, like, we don't need you to pay. We don't need, oh. like, you don't need to get any permits, like nothing. And we even went to the uh, police station, um, to get the, um, um, if we're trying to get the, um, scene on the bridge between Louisville and, um, uh, I think it was Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, so, and cops were like, so cool. They're like, oh yeah, we hate those guys. On the other side of the river, like we're gonna just block the uh, 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 block the um, bridge for you guys to shoot because like we hate them and like we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it for free. Just submit the paperwork. Like you don't need to do anything. We really. just submit the paperwork that you wanted. We'll do it. They were this is like, this is oh, the guys. police the police force that yes. was saying this for you. Yeah. Yeah, in Louisville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the. Um, and they were like, oh, guys, like, can we be part of your movie? We're so excited. Like, uh, we're <laughs> going to give you the, uh, we're going to give you cars. We're going to give you the, um, um, wardrobe. So just, we're going to be part of it as well. And people were there so cool and so open. Like, obviously, it was all within the law. Like, we didn't break any law there. But people were way more excited. And like she'll make and I mean, we're supportive more. too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're supportive. It's probably more of a novelty there than you know LA, it where is, everyone's yeah. like, "Oh, roll, I roll." <laughs> also, yeah. we were able to get the city hall for free, and city hall there is insane. It looks like it's it was made for the um, film Dune. Like it's insane city oh. hall. It's like so there's so much texture there and like raw concrete. Yeah, and like amazing, like really futuristic stuff, like so much texture for this and that's all to play with. Um, and they were also the same, like, yeah, sure, we're going to give it to you, but like submit the paperwork and submit it like at least like three days before the shoot. So, and then in prep, I started having red flags. I was like, what's going on? Why I'm the only one who is actually prep in the film? In a way of the, uh, like, usually when I prep, I'm a collaborator, I prep always with the director. Like, I have to get this connection established with the director, and uh, my whole prep, I'm working really intensely with the director. Like, we're building the shot list, we're doing the location scouts, we are um, creating the um, concept of the film, we're doing the test together, like everything. Yeah. And here, the director was kind of distant, and I was like, what's, what's going on? And for a couple of days, I was broken by myself, just like building the shot list, what I think is right for the movie, okay? what was happening. And the director was not involved in a way. And then he was telling, like, oh, I'm just talking to my wife. 
and he always was um, walking his dog too. He's like, oh no, I'm just talking to my wife. And I'm like, that's strange. Like, okay, I get it. Like all of us, we have lives, right? Something might happen, but it was something strange about him. So then when I was blown away with the with the project and like I leave to give everything I have to this film, like I was so excited. So, and then uh, we started uh, shooting uh, stunts. So our first week of shoots was stunts, and we got amazing people from Marvel. Um, we got the um, great stunt coordinator who was able to do the um, crazy stunts, cars driving backwards in the opposite flow of the uh, uh, driving, and they did it in like they did one rehearsal half speed, and next time we were all just shooting. Like they oh did it just once, and then we'll be shooting full speed. Wow! And I was like, "That's insane! How you guys do it?" Right? And we have the um, cars flipping, um, car stunts with the shootings, with the with the cars blowing, blowing up, like a lot of shit, really. And um, what a fun shoot! Yes, yes, it was insane. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, some some of it I have it in my reel still. Like when the cars are hitting each other. Um, and then at the end of the week, stunts didn't get paid. Wait, and, so the stunts didn't get paid? Yes. And you huh. can't you can't fuck with stunts. Like that's the first rule in industry. You can't fuck with the two Don't people. Fuck with stunts. <laughs> yeah, with stunts and with the uh, transport. Like these are the toughest departments you can't really play games with. So that makes sense. And the um, yeah, stunts and teamsters. And the uh, what's happening next? Next, we have um, a visitor from SAG on set, and she's like, "I'm putting it in default, oh, guys." <laughs> she puts us in default, so we can't continue shooting. Uh, because apparently they were um, way more behind it. Um, they didn't also, as far as I know, maybe it was not true, but as far as I know, they didn't give the deposit to SAC as well, factors. So we sit in there for like a week and we're depressed because we don't know what's happening because we still, ooh, they didn't pay to us as well. Like I, I didn't get paid even for the prep I did as well. So I'm so like, no one gets three paid. Or four weeks in, no, and everything's just and completely they, halted, and you guys have yeah, no yeah. idea what's and going on. We don't on. know what's happening, and but I forgot to mention another quick thing, red flag. When we were in prep, uh, the trailer of our um, uh, production designer got stolen because, like, these guys, like, apparently, uh, we were in the um, kind of. Um, um, we we were living in a kind of criminal active area in Louisville. Yeah, and she parked the truck on the street, and it got stolen. But was it full of a bunch of stuff you guys needed for the film? Oh yeah, there was all her tools, a bunch of um, bunch of uh, wardrobe as well, because she came from so, the uh, with with the wardrobe too. <laughs> And the, um, and I was like, it's really strange. It's like first time it happened to me on set that the trailer got stolen. It's like, it's insane really to think about it. Uh, and we were like, okay, fine, but we're going to continue. Right. So then the switch hits and nobody got paid and we're like, okay, what's going on? Then we start Googling Then we start Googling about the, um, uh, producer first. Now, the producer's name was uh, Joel Shapiro, or Jake Shapiro. And then we realized that he has around 16 lawsuits against him in uh, Georgia. Uh -uh. And there was a huge case when he was about to build some sort of uh, universal in Georgia. He got, like, so many millions uh, for this project, and then he stole it and, and ran away to the um, different state. We started Googling, right? We started Googling. And we find out that this producer 
which he is a con artist. And then later, in a couple of years after that, I realized that he is pretty famous con artist, really. And oh, wow. uh, him and another woman who was working with him pretty tight, they're like two con artists, pretty famous one. And yeah, I was that much like you, so I got the project with this guy. Um, and then we Googled about the director, and apparently what Google gave us, that he, was, he used to be a lawyer, but they took out his license because of fraud. Oh, um, God. And that's, again, that's that's what Google says. Right? It's, it's, it's somewhere, it's there, like people can check it for themselves. So the director's also um, in on this. Yeah. And the... Um, and then I realized that they're kind of working together. And I'm trying to talk to the director. And I'm like, dude, do you know who, you, who your producer is? And he's like, oh, I didn't know. Like, I, I, like, I didn't know what it was about. And that was really strange that uh, it happened. And that's a lie. Obviously, that's what they say. Like, it's, it's lie. Like, sure, it's yeah. lie. But, like, why there's, like, you can literally go to the... Uh, um, court uh, website, and you can fi find these cases against these people. Oh um, my god! Yeah, it's public knowledge. So, yeah, and the um, and then what's happening? Then we're freaking out. I think we shot maybe for like another week or so, but then we stop until we get paid. And the um, first uh, production design quit. And that was a hilarious mo uh, morning. I'm um, walking to set, and I see how the um, production design is running with a box of props, and the producer is trying to chase her to like grab these props. And meanwhile, the wardrobe is throwing a wardrobe on the on the on the um, on the street, like just throwing no. it around. Like fuck you guys, fuck you. <laughs> There's a oh scene. My God. And I'm what like, a scene. Yes. This is That's dramatic. Yes. yes. And I was like, what, what, what are we going to do? Okay, I guess we're going to continue shooting. I don't know. So, and we shot this last day. And we had the night scene and that day when the whole crew left. And um, they did one really, really bad thing for what they, I think, have to go to jail with. Um, so, these producers, they had guns. They own guns. Okay. Uh, real ones. Right? Because, like, in, oh in some states, like, like in, in California, I think, as well, like, you can have the permit to carry it, right? Like, okay. permit to go yeah. in a range and another permit to carry it, right? So, they had guns, and... Uh, in the scene, we should have uh, John Cusick shooting almost in the camera, right? And we used to have a gunner who who was the production designer's gunner, right? And this gunner, he obviously shows us this is prop, the not real, like how how it usually done, right? It's like, like it's a protocol a safety. Yes, 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 absolutely. And this gunner quits. With her, obviously, right? So what these guys did, um, we rolled the camera, uh, and the um, ADM didn't run the protocol before we, um, we were about to shoot. And then right before the director says action, AD said, stop, let's cut it. I need to check the gun. Like, he was he was also frustrated, but but thanks God he, uh, he stopped this shoot. Because he opens the uh, uh, opens the gun and it's uh, a real bullet. No, and it's only one. Yeah, it was loaded. What? One one real bullet. So, and he and was the supposed to shoot it like toward that. the camera. It would have yeah, yeah. got yeah. you. Yeah, that's right. It will it will be not the camera. It will be me, like directly. Holy shit! Yeah, and How it was pretty close happen? also. Well, oh and then. Like the, because these guys, they were, they thought that they can do everything and they can threaten the, uh, they can set up the production designer. They were um, thinking to, um, to, to blame her for that, that she was not there to check it, but they did it without her, without the gunner, with like, with, uh, without any protocols, 
Right? Oh and my then God. They, they threaten the crew as well. So I don't know, they might go, they might go for me as well after this interview, but that's what they do because that's what bad people do really. Holy shit. And <clears throat> yeah. And, um, then we quit. So then we were, we so. went to fun after that. Yeah. Uh, they were not able to buy us tickets, uh, to go back home. So the people who bought tickets, they were investors who were not related to the film at all. Or they were friends of investors who were there and who literally told us like, guys, just for you to know, we're not affiliated anyhow with this production. They're bullshit. We just buy you tickets because like you deserve it. You deserve wow. to be uh, at, to be at home with your family on Christmas. Um, and the, um, and uh, what happened next, but then they're telling us like, okay, if you like, are, are you going to be back from Christmas? And I'm like, guys, but like, what are you talking about? Like you even didn't pay us. Like, how do you expect us to be back after Christmas? So obviously, uh, they didn't pay us. They hire the crew in, um, I think from Kentucky or somewhere around that area to continue the film. So basically this, this film was shot with the two DPs, right? Me and another guy. So it was yeah. like half and half. And that was funny that after that, um, we got paid only because the um, the guy who bought this film and he was trying to get it back on tracks and get sold. Um, and we became uh, buddies with him, and only that's how we got paid. Really. And wow. other than that, I'm pretty sure these guys will never pay. And I know that they did couple a couple more films after that in kind of the same concept. So, in as far as I understood, I'm just guessing. But it might uh, be true that the stolen truck, uh, then um, then the um, uh, honey wagons the producer was buying for cash, for production cash, and putting this money on his driver, putting this honey wagons in his driver's name. So he was basically um, uh, having, I think... Um, insurance frauds so probably they they might oh, yeah. tell it like they they uh, they got robbed right it got yeah. stolen but it was actually not because most likely they stole it that would make sense yeah. this is so crazy like do you think that the producer and director these these con artists actually intended to finish the the movie and put out a movie or do you think the whole thing was just a whole scam for them to embezzle money i don't know money? i don't know you never know because, like, after that, I met people for whom I think it was intentionally not to finish the film. But for them, I think they truly believe that they can finish it, but also got some nice cut. But and I don't it's not know. Pay, pay in the crew. They thought people were just going to yeah, yeah, yeah. keep working for free. And the saddest thing that it's not much you can do. Sure, you can file the, uh, um, you can file the class action. Right, you can file the to, to labor board, but those cases, these companies, they can just uh, go bankrupt, and you can't do anything with them. Like there are so many cases of people trying to get paid for like years, mm. and people just filing for bankruptcy, and that's it. They're like, yeah. then the system can't get them. They're like, okay, I don't have money to pay. Like, what what do you want me to do? Like, where I should get this money? But there's another thing that these people forget. I've heard something about the um, uh, 1099C. So apparently you can file this 1099C that these people owe you money and they have to pay taxes on this money. So, uh -huh. and if they, if, if in our law system we can't get them accounted for what they did. I think IRS can do that. Yeah. So like if you but, do it right, if you do it like if if they can if they have to be paying uh, uh those taxes on the money they owe you. 
But it's again, I'm not a specialist. <laughs> That's what I've heard. I'm not a specialist. But, oh yeah. my god, that's I, uh, crazy. I think that I think like f fraud like this, this happens, happens in filmmaking a lot more than people recognize. Like especially because this was this was like an independent production. This was not union. This one's yeah, talking yeah. about. Uh, yeah, I'm fairly certain Nikita and I were working on a project that was like we had no idea until like later back like later on we were looking back on it like. Oh, I'm fairly certain this is part of like a whole fraud operation. No, oh and it's still God. going on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that's crazy. It's 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 pretty. It is more common than people think that this kind of stuff like happens, and, and it's wild. It's crazy. And this brings us bring us back to what I was saying before. Like, really, it's not worth it. Like all these problems, it's not worth it at the end like okay how much money are you gonna get out of it right like i don't know like hundred thousand so like how many or how much really but then then your reputation is bad right then like okay even if the law system if they can't get you like people are not gonna work with you right and this people this industry it's so tight it's like everybody know each other like i was really surprised that people know like some other people, I don't know, they know me. Because, yeah, we might think that, like, there's so many productions working on a constant basis, but it's a really tight community. And these people who are working on a film, they are there to help you, really, with, with the collaborative effort to create something unique, to create something what might change people, people's lives. Maybe like it's gonna be something that's gonna make other people's lives better, right? And uh, and then we're facing this. Like it's just it's just so low, and it's not worth it. And why people why people do scams and filmmaking? It's like I I don't know. It's hard for me to help comprehend. It's not the easy money which we. Really, Kind of, like you're gonna be fucked at the end. Like for sure, karma gonna right, get you. Yeah. So what's the point? People must love the thrill of it or something, because I, I can't understand it either. I feel like it it it's not gonna work out at the end of the day. I mean, maybe some of these people do get away with it, but there's just like so much, so many obstacles to like dodge and weave through, like to, <laughs> to do this. And you've got like a whole bunch of people who are like, wait, hold on, where's my fucking money? You know, yeah. like, this cannot be the easiest way to swindle people out of cash. Yeah. It's wild. Enjoying this episode? You can find the extended version via the link below. While you're there, please give us a like. It really helps us out. Igor, thank you so much for sharing sure. your, not only your stories, but also sort of just some of your philosophy and way you approach life. I think it's really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. Is there is there anything you wanted to share on share right with us that you're working on or uh, where people can follow you online? Uh, this is my first name, last name uh, in Instagram. Right. And my website is the same, my first name, last name, dot com. Okay. Uh, what I'm working right now, like I'm working on a couple of projects, like they're in a stage of, um, a couple of them in the stage of financing, uh, which is hard nowadays. And the one is in the production side. Like we, we, we secured a couple of millions, but we need more. It's a musical, really cool musical about the, like imagine Sin City meets, um, Wes Anderson and the, okay. um, and with kind of Danny Elfman thing, but it's, it's about the Ellis Island in the beginning of century when immigrants coming back from Europe to America. So in that sort of setting and like very much inspiring, very much about the, about hope, about new world about struggles but struggles like people people go through struggles with um with a song and with a happy approach and yeah that's a that should be a really cool one. Oh, i can't wait to see it like you got to share that with us when it's done yeah. no thank you for talking with us so i guess that uh wraps up this episode of shoot the shit thank you for joining us join us for the next shit show